One of the earliest and most important sanctuaries in ancient Greece was Olympia. Here, the ancient Olympic Games have their mythological origin 2,800 years ago. Olympia lies in the valley of the Alfios River, in the western part of the Peloponnese Peninsula. This was a Pan-Hellenic site, meaning that visitors from all over the Greek world were welcome here, helping to build the identity of the ancient Greeks as a civilization. Important games were celebrated in different cities across Greece, but the biggest and most important ones were the Olympic Games. Thus, in the ancient world, an Olympiad was a measure of four years, named after the Olympics, as they were celebrated every four years. The sacred precinct, named Altis, was enclosed by a wall and was primarily dedicated to the god Zeus and his wife Hera, although other gods were also worshipped there. By the time the new temple of Zeus was completed in the 5th century BC, the Altis had acquired a fully organized layout, containing buildings that show essential aspects of Greek life and athletic competitions. The follows that you see upon entering to the Altis is known as the Philippian. It was an Ionic circular shrine dedicated to King Philip II of Macedon. A follows was generally not dedicated to a deity, but to a human figure. It had 18 Ionic columns on the outside, and inside there was a pedestal with statues of the king's family surrounded by nine engaged Corinthian columns. The roof was composed of marble tiles stuffed with a bronze flower. A few meters north from the Tholos is the Pritanion, a building where government officials met. And to the east of the Tholos is the Temple of Hera, one of the most important buildings in the sanctuary and one of the most interesting. This is a very old building, so it illustrates the process of transition from wooden construction to stone. As usual with archaic temples, the Temple of Hera is long in proportion to its width. So the platform of two steps on which it stands measures 51 meters by 19 meters. It was a hexa-style temple with six columns at the narrow sides and 16 at the long sides. The thick walls of the naos are of ashlar stone to a height of one meter, but all the upper parts of the wall were of sun-dried brick strengthened with wooden framing. Both internal and external columns were originally of wood but were gradually replaced with stone ones over a period of centuries. Thus, they vary in their details and in the number of pieces they're made of. In front of the temple, there is the altar of Hera. Not much remains, but here the lightning of the Olympic flame takes place even today. Behind the temple of Hera is the Nymphium, which means the home of the nymphs, goddesses of water. It was a fountain donated by Herod's Atticus to the sanctuary in order to provide water to the masses who attended the Olympic Games. The Nymphium was a structure that terminated an aqueduct that brought fresh water to the sanctuary. These pentagonal structures that you see here in the middle of the Altis are known as the Pelopion and the Hippodamion, which according to the myth were the sites where the tombs of Pelops and Hippodamia were placed. Pelops was a king who founded the Olympic Games and the Sanctuary of Olympia in the 8th century BC, after winning the hand of Hippodamia in a chariot race. The tomb of Pelops became an altar where every year a ram was sacrificed in honor of Pelops. The Peloponnese Peninsula was named after him. The largest and most important temple is the Temple of Zeus. It was designed by Liban of Elis during the 5th century BC. Just like most of the great Doric temples, it has a hexa-style configuration, having six columns on its front and back, and 13 on the sides. The columns equal those of the Parthenon in height, but are much greater in diameter. That's why even though this temple had fewer columns than the Parthenon, the dimensions of both temples are very close to each other, the Parthenon being slightly bigger. Of course, the Parthenon was completely made with white pentelic marble that shined in the sunlight, while this temple was mostly made of a poor quality limestone since that's the kind of rock that you find in the area. 
To make it look like marble, they faced the rock with white stucco, made with marble dust. All the sculptures in the temple, though, were entirely made of marble brought from the island of Paros. The sculpture of the pediments achieved a serenity and composure of supreme monumental quality. The east pediment, the one above the main entrance to the temple, depicts the myth of foundation of Olympia, where Pelops wins a chariot race against Inomaus with the help of the god Zeus. And the west pediment depicts a battle where the Lapiths defeat the centaurs with the help of the god Apollo. The metapiece of the temple depict the feats of Heracles who fought terrible monsters. Therefore, the sculptural theme of the whole temple was a triumph of civilization over barbarism. And that is what sports represented for the ancient Greeks, a symbol of a civilized society, referring to Greek civilization. But the most important part of this temple was the fact that it housed one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the statue of Zeus at Olympia. Around 430 BC, the temple received the colossal statue made by the great sculptor Phidias, who had been exiled from Athens. Phidias had already made one of the most impressive gold and ivory statues of ancient Greece, the statue of Athena Parthenos inside the Parthenon. But this statue certainly surpassed it. The statue depicted the god seated upon his throne, it was constructed using a wooden core overlaid with ivory and solid gold panels, along with a silver crown and an eagle crafted with an alloy of all known metals at the time. Standing over 12 meters tall including its pedestal, the statue emerged impressively, its head nearly touching the temple's ceiling. Visitors were awestruck by its size with Zeus appearing as though he could demolish the temple's roof if he were to rise from his throne. Outside of the sacred complex, this construction used to be the workshop of Phidias. He built it with the same dimensions of the naos of the Temple of Zeus, so that he could work on the statue with the correct proportions. Phidias's workshop later became a Byzantine church, whose ruins you see today in that site. Thanks to its grand dimensions and heavy proportions, this is arguably the finest manifestation of the Doric temple, behind the Parthenon, of course. On the eastern side of the complex, the Echo Stoa was located to separate the stadium with the enclosed space of the Altis, so that the stadium was no longer visible from the temples. The Echo Stoa was a covered portico with a colonnade open to the space of the sanctuary. It could be used for displaying and selling goods, but also as a place for public or religious meetings. Its name is due to the acoustic features of its design. It is said that a single word could echo seven times. It measured 91 meters by 9 meters, and it was faced with Doric columns made of marble. Olympia was a sanctuary which commanded the support of all Greek cities. So just like in Delphi, individual cities from all over the Greek world would offer a building resembling a small non peripteral temple called Fisavros or Treasury, where they would store lavish offerings to the sanctuary. The treasuries of Olympia were located to the north of the Altis, before the entrance to the stadium. And in front of them was the Mitron, a small temple dedicated to the mother of the gods, Cybele. To access the stadium, athletes had to pass through this 32-meter-long vault known as Kripti, a monumental entrance to the stadium. This type of construction was very rare in ancient Greece, as round arches were mostly used and perfected until the Roman period. The stadium was the race course where the games were celebrated. In the early period of the Olympics, the games consisted mainly of foot races. But as time passed, other athletic performances took place in the stadium. There is a stadium in most ancient Greek cities. But in the case of Olympia, the stadium was planned with a semicircular end on the side of a hill, just like theaters, so that the seats could be cut out of the sloping sides. The capacity of the stadium is estimated to 45,000 spectators, so it was considered one of the largest of its time. 
The track, or dromos, was 600 Greek feet long, which is close to 200 meters. But for female competitions, the length was reduced by one-seventh. Most of the seats have disappeared as they were made of clay, a pretty ephemeral material. However, a small section made of stone survived. This was designated for the judges and the council members who were seated in the southern side of the stadium. At the opposite side, there's a marble altar dedicated to the goddess Demeter Hamini, goddess of the ground. There are some important buildings outside of the Altus walls. The first one is the gymnasium. Here, the athletes trained for the games. This is one of the largest ones you'll find in Greece, as they made it with the same dimensions as the stadium, so that athletes could better prepare for the games. They would practice activities such as jumping with weights, throwing the spear, throwing the discus. On one side, it had a Doric colonnaded portico, as long as the track in the stadium, where the athletes could run in bad weather, and on the other side was the Cladeos River. South of this is a smaller building, the Palaistra, or wrestling ground, a totally enclosed Doric colonnaded court with rooms behind the colonnades. South of the Palaistra is the Theocoleon, the permanent residence of the priestess of Olympia and other staff of the sanctuary. Next to this is Phidias' workshop, and to the west were baths and hostels for people to stay. South of these buildings is the Leonideon, placed to accommodate the important visitors of the Olympic Games. Although most visitors to the Games stayed at tents around the walls of the Altis, south of the walls of the sanctuary is the Buleftidion, a place for reunions of the judges and council members of the competitions. There were three main entrances to the Altis, the sacred grounds of the sanctuary. All of the buildings were positioned in a certain angle to be seen from these entrances. As I've shown in other sites such as the Acropolis of Athens, the buildings in ancient Greece are not positioned following orthogonal patterns with vertical and horizontal lines. Buildings are typically positioned at an angle so that you can see their volume and all of their columns, and also in a way that helps you understand the rest of the buildings and the landscape. So from each of the main entrances, the corners of each building are aligned with angles of 30 degrees. Today, all of the buildings are ruined, and there are many trees obstructing the viewpoints. But with the reconstructions, you can appreciate these views a lot better. From the southeast entrance, you can see that the mass of the Temple of Zeus would be balanced symmetrically by the Hill of Kronos in the background. And the Mitron would be balanced by the Temple of Hera. Both are symmetrically placed on either side of the axis leaving the axis free of buildings and in direction to the landscape, just like the Acropolis of Athens. This axial symmetry is clearly strengthened by two balancing groves of trees, one within the Pelopian to the left and the other in the Hippodamian to the right. The Nike statue was placed to occupy exactly the small angle of vision between the northeast corner of the Temple of Zeus and the southwest corner of the Temple of Hera, perhaps to emphasize the difference in volume of these two buildings. Its position is very similar to that of the statue of Athena Promachos on the Acropolis of Athens, which, when seen from the Propylia, stands exactly between the Erechtheion and the smaller mass of the altar of Athena. The top of the statue of Victory and the tip of the Acroterion and the Temple of Zeus were on the same horizontal level. This may also have been intentional, it seems clear that a principal aim of this symmetrically organized layout in which the landscape is incorporated was to maintain the importance of the central axial opening marking the processional route of the people through the sacred precinct from the entrance to the altars. Also from this entrance, the peak of the hill of Kronos lies directly to the north. Thus, one of the cardinal compass points is made an integral part of the composition. 
From the southwest entrance, you can see that the Nike statue exactly occupies the space between the Echo Stoa and the southeast building, which is a minor stoa. The outline of the Hill of Kronos appears to continue on the line of the architrave of the Temple of Zeus and link it to the Temple of Hera. The hill on the left and the Nike statue on the right thus form a visual unity with the Temple of Zeus. From here, the north point lies directly to the west of the Temple of Hera, so that this principal direction is again emphasized in the layout. And finally, from the northwest entrance, the outline of the mountains in the background is linked to the outline of the Temple of Zeus to form a visual unity. This is why Greek urban space is far superior to the urban space of any other civilization, because it takes into account the context of the landscape and form a visual unity with the architecture. Such was the prosperity of Olympia in the classical and Hellenistic periods of ancient Greece. For over a thousand years, such games took place every four years. Back then, the plain was crowded and busy. Year after year, new statues were set up, new gifts were brought, new buildings were built. Olympia was one of the richest places in the world. Its fame flew to every land. New people came to see its beauties. It was the meeting place of the world. But meantime, the bad fortune of Greece began. The Romans sailed over from Italy and conquered her. In Roman times, the Altis received a new boundary wall. Several of the former entrances were closed, and the northwest corner especially was transformed by the construction of a new stoa. As a result of these changes, the earlier system of relationships ceased to exist. The Roman Altis had become fully enclosed, thus many of the principles that had governed the composition of the site in particular, the use of the landscape as an integral part of the plan had now been abandoned. Often Roman emperors carried off some statues to make Rome beautiful. Shipload after shipload they took. The new country was filled with Greek statues. The old one was left almost empty. Later, after Christ was born and the Romans and the Greeks had become Christian, the emperor said it was not fitting for Christians to hold a festival in honor of a pagan god, and he stopped the games. He took away the gold and silver gifts from the treasure houses. He carried away the gold and ivory statues. Where Phidias's wonderful Zeus went, nobody knows. Perhaps the gold was melted to make money. In the 5th century, an earthquake shook down the buildings. The columns and the walls of the grand old temple of Zeus collapsed. That earthquake frightened the people away, and little was left of the beautiful old Olympia. However, the ruins remind us about the grandeur of Greek civilization, where sport, culture, and architecture converge to create a symbol of unity and prosperity. Yet its eventual decline reminds us of the impermanence of even the most magnificent legacies. I personally think that these Greek cities are just phenomenal, just the way you feel so in connection with nature and the way the buildings are arranged on the site. Uh, it's just fantastic. It's just very, very impressive. And um, there's so much more to see from ancient Greece on my channel. So make sure you subscribe and make sure you hit the like button so that I can continue producing uh, these videos. Uh, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you very soon in the next episode. Goodbye.